I welcome you to the 2021 Franciscan Zoom Lectures hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology at University of San Diego. Our presenter tonight, Brother Michael Blastic, holds degrees from the Gregorian University in Rome and St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri. He taught at the Washington Theological Union, the Franciscan Institute at St. Bonaventure University for 15 years, and then at Siena College prior to his present assignment on the novitiate formation team for the US six OFM provinces. We are excited to share that he will join the faculty of the Franciscan School of Theology at the University of San Diego in the fall. We are also excited to share that a festrit has been written in his honor. This volume is a collection of essays written by colleagues and friends in honor of Michael W. Blastic OFM on the occasion of his 70th birthday. The contributing scholars endeavored to address significant issues within the academic areas in which Michael has taught and published. This includes essays from our very own Father Joe Kenichi and Brother Bill Short. A link to this book will be found in the YouTube description of this lecture. Brother Michael's teaching, research, and publications have focused on the text and history of early Franciscan tradition. He is a member of the Franciscan province of the Most Holy Name of Jesus. I welcome here and now, and to the FST family, Michael. Thank you, Michelle, um, and thank you for that promotion. That was very nice, unexpected. Um, it's great to be with you this evening and to share some reflections with you on what is, I think, very significant, certainly for our Franciscan tradition, uh, in terms of the relationship between uh, creation and incarnation, and which uh, seems to have had a tremendous effect on Pope Francis in framing his recent encyclicals, Laudato Si and, um, and Fratelli Tutti. And I'd like to begin with, um, with a, a quote, quote from uh, Pope Francis Laudato Si, which I think uh, presents the, uh, the theme that I'd like to reflect on this evening. And, and he write, wrote a sense of deep communion with nature cannot be real if our hearts lack tenderness, compassion, and concern for our fellow human beings. It's no coincidence that in the canticle in which St. Francis praises God for creatures, he goes on to say, praise be you, my Lord, through those who give pardon for your love. Everything is connected. Concern for the environment thus needs to be joined to a sincere love for our fellow human beings and an, an unwavering commitment to resolving the problems of Laudato Si. Um, and and uh, again, it's, it is uh, that connection, that everything is connected, I think, uh, that, that emerges out of our Franciscan tradition, and I think sh has shaped some of Pope Francis' reflections. What I'd like to do this evening is to uh, talk about that Franciscan uh, approach to cre uh, in creation and incarnation using um, the texts of uh, Brother Thomas of Chilano. Brother Thomas of Chilano was a, a friar minor. He joined Francis around the year 1215. Um, and uh, at the time of Francis' canonization, he was commissioned by Pope Gregory VII to write his life, uh, a life, a legend that was uh, to be used to uh, present Francis and to pr promulgate Francis' cult uh, throughout the church. And so uh, Thomas of Chilano, who was an educated cleric, certainly no new, new uh, monastic theology very well, presents Francis as a very recognizable saint in this text by making him uh, sort of bring back to life some of the, th uh, some of the actions of previous saints. Uh, and that was for the purpose of, of making Francis a recognizable saint. But at the same time, he included uh, the, what was new with Francis, what Francis brought to the tradition. Um, he, he wrote this text, uh, and it was finished in February of 1229. Um, it was certainly approved and received by the Pope and then disseminated. Um, but after a, a few years, that text uh, became somewhat of a, a problem for the brothers of Francis, who thought it was too verbose, and they thought he spent too much time in, 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 in making Francis like other saints. So so they requested of the general minister that Thomas of Chilano shorten his text and revise it. And that's what he did. 
he was commissioned by Brother Elias, the Minister General, to do this. So it was written certainly sometime between 1232 and 1239, when Elias was the Minister General. We didn't know this text in its entirety. We only had uh, fragments of it in the manuscripts. But it was recently discovered uh, in 1215, uh, a, a private collector put up a, a, a manuscript, a codex on, for sale online, and it was noticed by a couple of scholars. And, and Jacques Dallarun investigated, and after his initial uh, study of the, of the manuscript, determined that it was indeed a Franciscan codex, a Franciscan book. And so uh, he was instrumental in having the, uh, the National Library of France purchase it, where it remains in their collection. Uh, to, to this day. Um, and it was uh, translated into English by Tim Johnson in uh, 2017. So this is a rather new text. Um, and in it, as we can see now, Chilano reduced um, his uh, earlier text by more than 50%. So it's much shorter, it's much more concentrated. And the focus is, is very much on the person of Francis. It's sort of like an essential Francis for the brothers. And it's more than just a, it's more than just a, a hagiography or a biography, because in this text, Chilano really um, reflects on uh, the, the uh, a actions and the life of Francis to try and get at their deeper meaning, and and he succeeds uh, very well in doing that. In this text, uh, which is described as the abbreviated life of Francis, uh, in Latin, the the Vita Brevior. He has two series of stories about Francis and creation. The first uh, appears uh, after um, a series of reflections uh, that Chilano makes on, the, on Francis and poverty. And in that section, he really presents Francis, uh, Francis' poverty as, as more of an ascetical practice that, leads, that led to the shaping of his own holiness, sort of a traditional approach. But, but immediately after talking about his poverty, he moves into these, into these stories about Francis and creation. Um, and he begins the section with, a, uh, with a, a, an outright statement, which is new to this text, that it was because of his dove-like simplicity that animals uh, sort of responded to him. And then he, he goes into a couple of stories about Francis preaching to birds. First, uh, at Bavania, um, he, he came across a flock of birds, and they uh, settled down and sort of listened to him. And so Chilano tells us that he preached to them as if they possessed reason. And then in a second story, um, he preached, uh, while well, he was preaching to people at Alviano, the sw a group of swallows was making noise, so he asked them to be quiet so that he could preach. And uh, he, he preached to them as well as if they were capable of reason, again, says Chilano. Then, he, then there's some stories about uh, Francis and wild animals, and he talks here about hares and rabbits. To those two, uh, he, he spoke to them as if they enjoyed reason and they paid attention for him. Um, and it was his, his maternal affection for him, Chilano says, that led him to call them uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, the same thing with fish. A fish was caught and was still alive, and so Francis released it, but the fish didn't swim away, it stayed near him. And, uh, and he called him brother fish, and then the fish sort of swam away. And then finally in this series on Francis and creation, um, he, 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 Francis changes water into wine again, because as Chilano says, uh, he, he obtained great dignity before God in the obedience of, of creatures. Um, so, so what is what is Chilano trying to communicate here? Well, again, um, he's he's interested not so much in in the in the stories themselves, but in their meaning. Again, um, this dove-like simplicity that um, Chilano talks about is a is a new piece of information in this text. It wasn't in the earlier text, and um, it's uh, it, it's a, a paraphrase of Matthew ten sixteen, where Jesus sends out the disciple and tells them to be as wise as serpents, as simple as doves. And, and Shalano says it's his simplicity that was the basis of this relationship. And, and as we, you read those stories, you can see that Francis' interaction with the creatures never uh, caused a change in their nature. 
uh, why the wild uh, animals didn't become tame, the birds you know, didn't stop being birds or the fish didn't stop being fish, they remained as they are. Um, and so he, he, he recognized their integrity and they maintained their integrity. And, and in the stories too, you know, he, Francis sort of breaks down the traditional hierarchy, uh, you know, beginning with the divine and then the spiritual uh, to the reasonable, sensate, and finally material. Francis treats all creatures as equals. Um, and uh, connected to that is that expression that Thomas uses here. And again, this is new in this text. Uh, the birds and the, uh, the rabbits, etc. they listen to Francis as if they were capable of reason. Wild beasts recognize Francis' piety toward them as if they enjoyed reason is the point that uh, Francis is, um, is trying to make here. And so um, some of the significant changes that, that Shalano makes in this text from his earlier text where we find these same stories is, is first of all, again, Francis underlining the dove-like simplicity of Francis. Um, and, and Francis um, it prefaces his mission, his, his, call, his description of, of the way the brothers are to go on mission to non-believers in his rule with this text from Matthew 16, to be as prudent as serpents and simple as dove. And so Chilano suggests that Francis makes this, this dove-like simplicity, the foundational quality of Francis' approach to creation, as well as, as, well as to humans. And again, as we saw in his encounter with birds, you know, he admonished the birds to listen to the word of God as if they were capable of reason, just as he would preach uh, to human beings. And in his relationship with wild animals, he called them brothers and sisters. Chilano says he related to them with the affection of piety, pietas. Piety is a, is a description of a family relationship, a familial relationship. And, and, and Shalano again describes how, you know, he would caress these creatures with maternal affection, the same affection that he would have uh, for his brothers. And so the, this abbreviated life of Shalano draws out the implication of Francis' behavior for a fraternal and a sororal experience of creation. Francis' approach to animals and humans is basically the same, his, he, this, his simplicity, his respect for their nature, and he engages them as, as members of the family. In a, there's a second series of stories in this text about Francis and creation. Uh, and again, most of these appear in uh, that earlier text, but again, these are much more concentrated and, and there's much more theological reflection attached to them. These stories appear uh, at, in, in the text after a description again of Francis sort of traditional, uh, uh, traditional, the, the traditional characteristics of a saint. He's described as a miracle worker. Uh, he's described as having a desire for martyrdom. And there's a description there of his three attempts to uh, get to, the whole, to, to, the, um, to Egypt, to the Holy Land, uh, and culminating with his visit with the Sultan. There's a description of his prayer and his preaching. And this section ends with a couple of stories about Francis' poverty, but here the poverty Francis talks about is not merely ascetical. It's more about Francis' desire to participate and, and to live like the poor. And so that's the way this section uh, of creation stories begins. The first is a description of a visit that Francis paid to Rome while he was still a merchant before his, um, before his conversion. Uh, and at St. Peter's, he exchanges clothes with the poor. And that's followed, again, by a story of Francis who reprimanded a brother because he doubted the, the truth of a, of a beggar. Didn't, one of the brothers didn't believe he was truly poor. And so he sent him away. And Francis responded by saying, he who curses a poor man injures Christ, whose image he carries. And from there, then, Francis turns to the, the nature stories, if you will. And he talks about, again, Francis visceral piety towards all creatures, lambs and worms and bees, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all of this, again, emphasizing his piety, his relationship with them. And then in the center of this section, uh, Chilano 
makes the point that the reason Francis um, desired to share the experience of the poor and the, and the reason for his piety, his familiarity with creatures was because of their single principle. All of them were creatures uh, and because they were all creatures of the same of the same source, they were therefore brothers and sisters. From there, he then goes to describe the pra a practice of Francis that uh, that he had. He would pick up scraps of paper, pieces of paper, and would put them in a reverent place, no matter what was written on them, because he believed that whatever was on that, whatever letters was was on that page, could could spell the name of the Son of God or God, and so he respected the written word as a sign of the word, the word of God. And then this section then comes to a close with a, a description of Francis' celebration of Christmas at Grecho, um, where he had a crib prepared, hay placed in the crib, and an ox and a donkey gathered near the crib. Um, and, and Shalano describes then how the brothers and the people came to celebrate you know, Christmas and there the gifts of God were multiplied. Uh, there's a new mystery. Gretchen becomes a new Bethlehem. And then it closes with a description of how the hay of the crib uh, healed animals and humans. So just to go back to these stories to point out a little bit more of, of Chilano's um, sort of theology at work here. Um, the first is this story about uh, Francis as the merchant in Rome uh, while he was still in the world. And, and while he was there, he felt, as, as you can see in the text that's underlined here, feeling compassion for these poor, he wanted to experience their miseries to see if he would be able to tolerate these things for a while. And so unknown to his companions, he set aside his own clothes and clothed himself with the disheveled and putrid clothes of the suffering. Coming among them, he sat down and begging. He cheerfully ate with them, Indeed, he, had, he said he had never eaten anything more delectable. Um, seeing these poor led to Francis' compassion, which led to his desire to identify with them. And again, sort of the dynamic that Chilano describes here is that Francis saw the poor, he felt compassion for them, and then he identified with them. Um, it's interesting, I think, that if when you read uh, Pope Francis' uh, exegesis of the parable of the Good Samaritan in Fratelli Tutti, um, he talks about that same dynamic and the importance as we reflect on the parable of what it is we see and what does that move us to do and how do we respond? What do we perceive when we see the poor? And then that story is, is uh, um, so, so in this story, Francis suggests that even before, excuse me, Chilano suggests that even before Francis' conversion, there was an almost natural response of compassion for the poor, which led Francis to desire to experience their miseries. This natural feeling is what eventually moved Francis uh, with the help of grace to the lepers and the beggars by the wayside. And that was the, the source of his conversion. So again here for, for Francis, seeing led to compa compassion which led to identification. Now this story of, of him as a, a merchant in Rome is a new story that wasn't in the earlier text. And it's interesting that Chilano doesn't put this in the chronological description of his conversion earlier in the text. He places it here, right before these stories of creation for a purpose, I think. Because here he is, I, I think, trying to describe uh, this, this natural compassion of Francis and, and, and what it led him to, wanting to experience their, their, their misery, their poverty. And, and in a similar way, we see this as, as what is at work in Francis and, and the, the creation stories that follow. And that story is followed again by, as I mentioned, by the story of the poor man um, uh, who, uh, uh, who, who was rejected by a brother and Francis reprimanded that brother. And he says, he who curses the poor Injures, uh, injures Christ who for us made himself poor in this world. And so Chilano suggests that um, Francis uh, uh, ac acknowledge, acknowledges the poor, uh, the poor man as the presence of Christ. He sees in the poor the presence of Christ. And from there then it goes to the, the, uh, the nature stories 
talks talks about um, his uh, uh, his attention to lambs and and sheep, and he would uh, sort of ransom them if they were on the way to the butcher shop. And and Shalano says there that he loved little sheep and lambs due to the grace of a simpler nature, his his uh, um, dove-like simplicity, if you will, and the likeness to the Lord Jesus re reflected in sacred scripture. And the same thing, he was compassionate to worms because he read uh, that what was said of the Savior, I'm a worm and no man, the, the suffering servant songs, and he would move them off the road. And, and he, he also cared for bees in the winter, especially providing them with honey and wine. Um, so again, you know, Chilano is pointing to the fact that for Francis, creation bears a likeness to Christ. And um, at, the, at the center of the text, uh, as I mentioned, he, he, Chilano makes the point that the reason for this was because that in, in every creature, he recognized a, a single principle that everyone shared, everyone that was created shared, and he would call them by a, by a fraternal name. Um, the sweetness that he enjoyed when contemplating in creatures the wisdom of the creator, his power and goodness. He was filled with extraordinary ineffable joy when he considered the sun and the moon, the stars and the firmament. There's an echo of the canticle of sun. Truly, he preached to the flowers, spores, trees, and stones as if they were capable of reason. And then finally, on account of their single principle, he called all creatures by a fraternal name. Um, Chilano frequently described, as we saw, various elements of creation, um, animal as animals, as if they were capable of reason. And again, it was their single principle that everyone shared, that, that the poor and the rich and, and every, every, every aspect of creation um, shared um, uh, that in the single principle that led Francis to express his experience of universal fraternity, beginning with the poor and moving even to uh, worms and stones. And from there then he goes to the story about the picking up pieces of paper. And the reason he did this, Chilano says, as you can see here, whenever he found anything written, divine or human located in a dishonorable place, he reverently recovered it and moved it to an honorable place out of reverence for the Savior. The good that is there pertains to God alone, to whom all good belong. So letters and words are expressions of God's goodness. And, and that's because for Francis, they can express the divine word, which is their ultimate source. And then finally, um, the, this section concludes with the story of Grecho. And again, you're probably familiar with this story, but it's much more focused, you might say, in this in this abbreviated uh, life of Francis by Chilano. Um, you know, he he talks about how on Christmas night, in which Christ was born on earth, he had a crib prepared, hay placed in the crib, and ox and donkey gathered near the crib. Um, and and as I said before, he goes on to describe the celebration and how this was a new mystery. Um, and, uh, and, and the cave with the animals and the manger with straw um, becomes a temple. Uh, it becomes a temple, a place where God dwells with people. Uh, a church was eventually built over this is what Jelano is referring to. But here it's much more the sense that this place, this place is a place where God dwells with God dwells with us. God dwells with creation. And, and it's, it's God's place. It's Jesus' place. It's as if Jesus belongs here. Um, and so the incarnation uh, celebrates creation. It brings creation, in a sense, to conclusion. And so again, to sort of look at these, this second section here, uh, sort of in a thematic way, you know, it began, as we saw, with Francis' desire to experience the misery of the poor because the poor bear the image of Christ. Francis wants to become incarnate in the condition of the poor. And from there, uh, you know, he goes and, and shows how creatures image Jesus Christ. Lambs and worms and bees uh, image Jesus as he is represented in, creature, in, in scripture. Creatures are experienced by Francis as words of God. And on account of their, then at the center, on account of their singular principle, he calls each one by their fraternal name. Huh? And he preached to the flowers, forests, trees, and stones as if they were capable of reason. Crops and vine and splendors of the field, 
the plant of the garden, earth and fire, air and wind. He reminded them all with, sincer with the sincerest purity to love the divine and urge their willing service. He preaches to them as if they have, as if they have reason. And then the words on the paper, putting them in an uh, honorable place out of, uh, out of respect for the Savior, letters and words image God just like creatures. And finally, Grecho, the incarnation, the new mystery of God in a manger with hay and an ox and an ass. The place of the crib is consecrated as a temple to the Lord. A God desires to be with the lowly and the poor. This is the motive of the incarnation. And so again, what is Chilano saying here? What is he suggesting? There's one principle for everything, the creator. And this is at the heart of, um, of his, of the fraternal experience lived by Francis with everyone and everything. Because everything belongs to the created order and everything created is constituted by the same radical dependence on the creator. There is a, there is a, a, a unique, uh, relationship that God has with everything that exists. And this is the basis for the equality Francis recognizes between all beings. They, they share in common the con condition of creaturehood. And so he could relate to creatures with a visceral piety, uh, an effective bond or relationship uh, to everything that existed, even non-sensate creation, rocks and crops, as, as Chilano says. Because Chilano understands and, 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 and says this is, this is what he learned from Francis, that each creature images the creator. Each creature is a word of God in its individual distinctness. We have a connection to everything deep inside of us. And Francis desired to experience the miseries of the poor because of Jesus. Uh, uh, he, experience, he desires to experience the miseries of the poor because of Jesus' desire, the Son of God's desire to experience the miseries of poor creatures. This is the motive of the incarnation. Everything is connected. Everything is brother and sister. The incarnation completes uh, the creation. And Laudato Si, if you've read these, and I'm sure you have, and there's been other presentations on these, are, are deeply rooted in this Franciscan experience. And I think Chilano's understanding uh, of Francis' relation to creation in the abbreviated life really, I think, helps us to mine these deep connections. Here again, uh, a quote from Fratelli Tutti. Um, this saint of fraternal love, simplicity and joy, who inspired me to write the encyclical Laudato Si, prompts me once more to devote this new encyclical to fraternity and social friendship. Francis himself uh, felt a, a brother to the sun, the sea, and the wind, yet he knew that he was even closer to those of his own flesh. Wherever he went, he sowed seeds of peace and walked alongside the poor, the abandoned, the infirm, and the outcast, the least of his brothers and sisters. And when you read um, Fratelli Tutti, this is, it is this experience, I think, that Francis is trying to communicate when he's, when he's trying to, to talk about social friendship and universal fraternity how we have to acknowledge the worth of every person and again, of, our, of everything in our common home and how everything has the right of integral development and how we're called to, to accompany everyone. Um, and we, we're, we're, we, we accom we're called to accompany everyone and everything with benevolence, uh, willing the good of the other in solidarity and doing this on an international level. And in all of the issues that Francis presents there, from migration to interreligious uh, cooperation, it's the same theme that is developed. Um, it's this, it's this um, as, as Chilana would say, this having this piety, this, this visceral uh, feeling and affection for everything that exists as members of a family and to respond accordingly. And so what links St. Francis and Pope Francis? Well, um, I think from one, one point of view or from one perspective, we saw how Chilano described Francis of a, as a person of visceral piety, um, while Pope Francis calls for a, a revolution of tenderness in Fratelli Tutti. He, he points to, Pope Francis points to tenderness as the condition for living as brothers and sisters. And he quotes from a, a TED talk that he gave in 2017 and this is what he said. 
He said, the third message I would like to share today indeed is about revolution, the revolution of tenderness. And what is tenderness? It's the love that comes close and becomes real. It's a movement that starts from our heart and reaches the eyes, the ears, and the hands. Tenderness means to use our eyes to see the other, our ears to hear the other, to listen to the children, the poor, those who are afraid for the future, to listen also to the cry of our common home, of our sick and polluted earth. Tenderness means to use our hands and our heart to comfort the other, to take care of those in need. And so both Francis of Assisi and, and uh, Pope Francis uh, remind us and challenge us that we need tender hearts. We need to see and to hear and to listen to the other and to our common home. Francis of Assisi is a great model for this and obviously Pope Francis recognizes it. And so like Pope Francis, excuse me, like Francis, Pope Francis suggests that we need to get close to the poor to feel their misery in order to understand, uh, uh, excuse me, in order to understand the incarnation, uh, in order to experience creation as brother and sister. That's the legacy of Francis. And that's, that's what Chilano, I think, tries to bring home in his uh, abbreviated life of Francis. Uh, and that's what Pope Francis challenges, challenges us all to do, to recognize cre creation is completed in the incarnation and incarnation uh, is God's experience of visceral piety for his creation, wanting to become a part of it, to become incarnate in it. Uh, that's the legacy that we need to, uh, to, to, to develop. Um, and uh, as Pope Francis says, uh, we need to, to create a revolution of tenderness uh, which is the answer for so many of the problems in our world today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your lecture. It was much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> this lecture is brought to you by the Franciscan School of Theology. We are very thankful to Brother Michael for his opportunity to, to learn from him this evening. Let's please give Brother Michael a round of applause.